then my parents, what I felt like they did really well is my dad was just like, you know what? Just come home and don't, you don't even have to worry about this next test. Don't study for this next test. Focus on ADHD. Learn everything you wow. can about it. So wow. he like took me. And you're how old to, now? Like 19? 19. Okay. Yeah. So he like, we were on Google together. He's like, let's go to the library. We went to the library. We, we were looking and searching and trying to find answers and looking for something that looked like my brain. And by the end of that, I think I spent like five or six days doing that. Mm. And like, you know, and my dad and I were like playing off each other. And I'm like, dad, did you know about this? And he's like, oh, yeah, look at what I read about this. And it became this like immersive experience where I think a lot of the shame part of it went away. And I was like, oh, this is wow. medical. But there's there's some incredible parts where your brain is moving fast and has all this possibility of all like wonderful things like mm -hmm. you just have to learn how to optimize it my dad's an engineer and he's all about like optimizing efficiency so he's like mm -hmm. we just have to harness this we can make this work better and i was like okay mm -hmm. let's do this that's amazing and so i think that was just such a wonderful no, number one total bonding with my dad which yeah, my dad, sounds really yeah. Nice. it was great it was great but it was also just like a very i think i think it got me to a spot it was like a little crash course in ADHD where I began to see this as this multifaceted thing that wasn't what was wrong with me but just like a part of me that could be utilized and explained and and like I got to enjoy parts of it after that experience I feel like that's so inspiring and just like amazing parenting like congratulations there's to your dad a plus parenting yeah a plus. I, I just feel like there's so many applications of that that's so cool they he pivoted they he had previously made this decision that for personally as someone who was a special ed educator I would question that decision to like not share with your child or, or to to create a culture of like secrecy around a diagnosis yeah. but they then he pivoted when sure. new information yeah. came to light and when, you know, you came to him. So I think that's really cool. Like the the fact that you can change your mind, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And I, yeah. I think that also that that fell on the, like we were learning more about ADHD and it was also yeah. less stigmatized. And I think that everything all came together and worked out at the right time. I think yeah. that uh, like it was, a l it was hard for me in the beginning, but I think having that, just like little pocket of time with my dad to learn about ADHD. I, it changed all of it to me because I was like, I can, I can work with this. This isn't, I, I this is doable. I can, mm -hmm. I can deal with this, which is nice. He gave that to me. It's beautiful. It's and it's what you've done. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. You know a lot about this far more than we do. So I don't know where to start, but there's like, there are these gender dimensions of ADHD. Like it manifests differently in boys and girls. So males get diagnosed three times more likely than wow. females. Three to four times more likely. So wow. pretty significantly more. Do we understand why? Are they not three to four times more likely to have it? They just get diagnosed more? It's just, they get diagnosed more. Wow. And, and so uh, there's not like... You know, it's hard because you don't really know the number of undiagnosed people. So it's hard yeah. to get a good statistic on that. Right. But in terms of why, I think it's because they present as hyperactive. There's the ones disrupting classes. There's starting riots. <laughs> starting riots. <laughs> yes. Um, they, they typically, when you look at um, a presentation of an inattentive type, you're getting a lot of internally focused symptoms. So inattentiveness, difficulty organizing things. They might have a difficulty with losing things. And, you know, you're having a lot of just internal stuff that's bothering you significantly, making your life more difficult. But it's not like you're ruining a class or, you know, you're not you're not making things absolutely intolerable for everybody else so that you generally get yourself. to pass through. Just for mm. yourself. Yeah. So that's kind of like a little bit about the gender stuff. Now, in terms of just ADHD in general and the, like, metamorphosis of, like, just how it's been changing, how it's been viewed by the public, I think that in terms of validity of diagnosis, I'm biased. I think it's pretty valid <laughs> because mm -hmm. I I sure, feel yeah. like it is my diagnosis and it's what I have poured a lot of myself into. But I think that there's also like with a lot of people who have done work in this area, 
they they've been looking into how does trauma affect ADHD? How does trauma affect other mental health diagnoses and things like that? And I think I think there is some validity to that. What trauma absolutely worsens everything. Yeah. Everything. Mm-hmm. Everything. Everything. Trauma being a wound, I think that's important in terms of like real significant thing that shapes how you move forward. So yeah, if you're looking at trauma in that context affecting everything, I think it absolutely affects how your ADHD presents. Now what I would say and where I disagree and differ a little bit is I think that it truly does come from a genetic basis. And I think that it's being passed on from family to family, generation to generation. And so I think there is a genetic predisposition to that that I don't think is explained by trauma. I think trauma can make it worse, but I think this is something you're probably born with. And epigenetics might be the bridge, right? Because they say with epigenetics, like trauma is passed down for seven generations. So like, who knows, you know, we're like the first person. I I feel like I tried to spell epigenetics on a word processor (laughs) in the last couple of years. And it did not, there was no version of it that was correct. So I was, That's true. I was thinking to myself, like, is this a word that is not yet in this outdated Lexicon. word processor's dictionary? Mm-hmm. Like, because I, epigenetics is not a, an old. But field, isn't it, no. is right? it some, is it something that people disagree on? Like some yeah, people kind of believe I'm in it, some like. people don't. No, don't know, that's what I thought. About the, about the controversy behind epigenetics okay guys sasha was a like a master spelling bee player i don't know what to say i really really thought that pen was using that as a segue to ask i was like wow that is some like fine crafting to i know yeah well let's do it let's do it i like it i like it it's a good segue yeah i'm really good at spelling sasha i want to ask you a bonus question bonus question i just want to know what was the hardest word you had to spell in your middle school spelling bee so the word i messed up on is shammy. Do you know how to spell shammy? Shammy? Is it not? Do I know? Well, use it in a sentence. No, use it in it's a sentence. not. What is shammy? <laughs> Sorry. Is like a sham wow? Are we talking about it? What's a shammy? It's like a sham wow. It is a sham Is it a word? Oh, it's a word. It's not fair to you. Um, It is <laughs> it's a like a rough or it's like a soft suede thing used oh, for yeah. wiping. Okay, wait. Is it they use S- that in pottery? <laughs> S-C-H-A-M-M-Y? No. Nope. It's I-E at the end, right? No. It's what? O I S at the end. Yes. Yes. Oh, C-H-A-M-O-I-S. that's right. O I S. I'll use it in a sentence for you. No, I'm just kidding. And do you know how, why I mess it up? You would get this like booklet of words that they could potentially use, and so my mom would go through it every like when we were preparing at nighttime. She pronounced that word chamois. They entire yeah, that's time. how I would pronounce it too. Yeah, you're like the French chamois, chamois, and so like then they said chamois. I was like. What the shit is that? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> I don't know what that is. At that age, did you say to your mother in bed, what the shit is that? <laughs> Maybe. Mom, what the shit is that? She's like, got to give this girl more magic medicine. we got to get her more. She's swearing at get us in bed. Get her the Flintstone vitamin. <laughs> I do want to ask you one more question about ADHD. Yeah. Um, earlier, you mentioned that part of why your family might have like hidden that diagnosis has to do with stigmas. Yeah. And Penn had sort of entered that by saying that there it's more in the lexicon today. So I wanted to ask from your perspective and what you've seen, is there less of a stigma? Could we go further in eliminating the stigma? And if so, how, how can we do that? How can we support people as family members, as community members, as teachers who get that diagnosis? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. yeah. I think there's for sure still a stigma. I think there's less. There's less. And I think that as we talk about it and expand these conversations a little bit more, I think Every time we do that, we help reduce stigma. There is a uniqueness that comes from ADHD that makes your brain work in a different way. And I think that can be very poorly understood and it can be misconstrued as you're being lazy, you're being reckless, Mm. you're being thoughtless, you're being, you know, it's all these volitional components that you're not. But I think once you start to learn and explore more about ADHD and the basis and how your brain actually works, it helps reduce stigma. 